Hey, what's up, you freaks? What's yeah, up, freaks? What the hell's up? Freaks. What up, something else freaky? <laughs> An H. 16 engine. That is a flat engine with yeah. 16 cylinders. I didn't even know that was a thing. We found out it was today. Yeah, okay. How about a V12 engine that revs to 11,000 RPM? How yeah. about that? You know the difference between over squared, under squared, and squared pistons? Maybe? Well, now we do too. Thanks to this freaking podcast about a bunch of British guys who used to work for Lotus and then didn't work for Lotus and then started a little company called Cosworth. You know how they came up with that name? It's a portmanteau. It's a portmanteau to find Port out what that is. It's portmanteau. It's a fondue. <laughs> portmanteau is like a sweet wine. That you it eat is. Dessert. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, this is the past gas on Cosworth. Part one. <laughs> Cosworth is a little company founded in London in 1958 by two Lotus employees, one Mike Coston and Keith Duckworth. <laughs> From an experimental partnership, these two managed to alter the course of automotive history, both on and off the track. Between 1968 and 1974, every single Constructors' Championship in F1 was won by the same Cosworth engine, the DFV. And in 1969 and 73, every single F1 race was won by a DFV-powered car. This one engine was responsible for F1 wins across four decades, the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. But who the hell is Cosworth? What's their magical formula? And most importantly, how did two gentlemen engineers in suits manage to create an engine-tuning empire that changed racing for decades? Today on Pass Gas, it's part one of our two-part series on Cosworth. Pass Gas Podcast! It's about cars, it's not about ports! Big thanks to Indeed for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash Pass Gas. Just go to Indeed.com slash Pass Gas right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash Pass Gas. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Uh, what's a duck worth? Oh, that'll be costing you a fortune. Huh? That's a really specific joke. That's how I remember their names. <laughs> <laughs> What's a duck worth? Uh, that duck will be costing you a fortune. I feel like ducks are probably pretty cheap, though. Probably. Depends on what kind of duck you're into. Yeah. Normal one. You can get a crispy duck on New Year's Eve for 30 bucks. Oh, I love crispy duck. Cause it's worth it. It's worth it. I've only had duck once. Why, where are we on duck? Uh, <laughs> Duckworth, Cosworth, Costin. My name is Nolan Sykes. Sitting across from me is one James Pumphrey. Give me back my son. Give me back my son. <laughs> Trying it out. <laughs> and Joe Weber. What's up, Wink Wink Nation? Let's keep it slimed up. Ooh, get it goosed. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say that. I don't know what happened. Uh, and and that sultry uh, anchor Hello. tone that Hello. you hear in the beginning, that was Nolan Sykes. Go ahead and goose it. Oh, uh, nice. Mm. Damn, mm. dude, that's sexy. Nice. Mm. That's sexy, yeah. dude. That's some, some zaddy stuff. Yeah, that was some zaddy it's stuff. Like you're sitting in an armchair like Arnold in, <laughs> in, in True, True Lies. Lies. Yeah. yeah. And Jamie Lee Curtis is dancing, and you're mm -hmm. like, go ahead and goose it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> go ahead and goose it for me. What does that even mean? Slower. Slower. Oh, go man. ahead and goose it. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and goose it for me. I watched the Arnold movie over Christmas break. Mm -hmm. Which one? Jingle All the Way. Ah. Oh, I've Good never one. seen it. Classic. Yeah. I think it's gonna. Does he play Buff Santa? I think it will. No, he uh, plays a father who's just running around town he, trying to get a toy for his kid. He uh, plays Turbo a, Man. It's a uh, one of Arnold's most normal mm -hmm. roles. It's like when, he crushes it. Yeah, it's that point in his career when he's like, I don't want to just be an action star. Yeah. I can just be a dad. I have to it's put really on a good. business suit. Phil Hartman's yeah. in it as like the neighbor, annoying neighbor. It's oh, like, nice. He's so yeah. he's oh, so Phil good. So, dude. Good. Yeah. so funny, man. Uh, but there's a moment in 
in Jingle All the Way where like Arnold is in disguise. So the whole movie, he's trying to find this action figure for his son that's like a Tickle Me Elmo type. Turbo thing. Man. Turbo, Turbo Man. Man. And uh, at one point, through hijinks, he dresses up like Turbo Man mm-hmm. in like the suit. Yeah. And uh, his son and his, it's like a Batman <laughs> dis- yeah. type disguise. Well, no, it's not. It's, yeah. like, it's like, <laughs> uh, just like a hood on his yeah. face and he's wearing gl- sunglasses. Yeah. They're yeah. very see through. Like it's yeah. hilarious. And they they're like know. interacting yeah. with him for a while. Yeah, for and the third act of the film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And at one point, he like he like takes him out and reveals it's him. And his son and his wife are like, "What? Yeah. <laughs> it's six, seven, it's three, so four. Funny. Yeah. I just thought Turbo Man was Austrian. <laughs> yeah, the, the most recognizable so physique it's, and yeah, voice yeah. in the history of humans. Oh, and uh, uh, <laughs> shit, what's his name? Um, not Sinbad. 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 Oh, yeah. Sinbad in his prime. Yeah, it's so good. Definitely yeah. check it out. Let's make Jingle All. We got one year to do yep. it, folks. Yeah. By this time next year, Jingle All the Way will be a Christmas classic. I hope so. It's the a great movie. only Christmas movie officially endorsed by the Pascast Podcast. That part is true. The Donut Podcast Network and Studio Seventy One. <laughs> <laughs> that is a really good movie. And we're basically like Turbo Men. We're basically Turbo Men. Yeah. Oh, Ooh. that's a cool name for a podcast. <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> it sounds old and new. Yeah. Yes, it does. If you if you're listening right now and you're good with Photoshop, make a logo and we'll see if we like the logo. Yeah, even if you're mid at Photoshop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah, more more. Actually, that makes more sense. of those mid. Yeah. All right, let's talk about some real life Turbo Men. How about okay. that? Ooh, oh, nice, nice. segue. Yeah. It's time to talk about Cosworth. Mike Costin was born in 1929 in Hendon, UK. Growing up during World War II, Mike followed the lead of his brother Frank and studied aeronautical engineering. He enjoyed piloting light aircraft and gliders. This interest in aircraft led him to uh, working for De Havilland Aircraft Company. Though auto racing quickly caught Mike's attention, Mike developed his engineering skills at this company and moonlit as a race car driver and a very talented one at that. Keith Duckworth later said of his skills, quote, Mike, I've never seen him overcorrect a car. When the back end goes, he just puts on the right amount of opposite lock at the right time. The car carries on sliding and mysteriously as the curb approaches, it stops sliding and carries on. In the right direction. Awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Mike was introduced to Lotus cars by his friend who owned and drove a Lotus Mark III B. Uh, This led to frequent visits by Costin to the Lotus factory in Hornsey, which is north of London. This car. It's sick. Looks like a bug. It looks like if Batman was. Oh my God. I've never seen a car that looked like this. What? If they did like a Batman prequel with his dad and he was kind of a Batman guy, like he uh, would drive this. this. You know what you would call this movie? It's like set in the 30s. You'd call it Detective. Yeah. (laughs) This is like one of the. This is the strangest looking car. It's such a weird looking car. Listen, we look at cars for a living and I've never seen. It looks like a. Like a bug from a bug's life. It does look, yeah. It's very Pixar looking. It's so sick. And his his license plate is Dank 420. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> this thing's sick. I love that paint. Uh, at this time that Mike uh, visited the Lotus factory in Hornsey, <laughs> nice. uh, Lotus was looking to bolster <laughs> their racing division by selling more Lotus 6s, and they were in desperate need of help at the factory. Mike was approached by a friend of Colin Chapman uh, to work part-time building engines, and Mike agreed. For the next two years, Mike Costin split his time between de Havilland and Lotus, working on planes during the day, then racing engines at night. Quote, uh, I actually built Colin's racing engine, but I also did the production engineering for the six. I did all the thinking behind that. Colin didn't actually pay me any money. Oh, no, not Colin, <laughs> but I got gallons and gallons of petrol instead. This was just a little taste of Colin Chapman's unsavory business dealings. But if you want to know more about that, check out our whole episode on the man, uh, episode 202. I love Colin Chapman right out the gate, right out of the gate. These quotes are fire. Yeah, they're good. <laughs> these guys are talkers. <laughs> <laughs> really, really talk good. Keith Duckworth was a bit younger than Costin, born in 1933, but the trajectory of his career followed a similar path. Duckworth spent his early life attending the prestigious 
Giggleswick School. Shut up. <laughs> where he fell in love with everything Shut mechanical. Up. The prestigious Giggleswick Engineering School. <laughs> the prestigious Giggleswick. <laughs> Oh, the hallowed halls yeah. of Gizzle, Gizzle, Gizzlewick. G- G- Gizzlewick. Gigglewick, man. He was a Ravenclaw. Yeah. Like Gigglewick. <laughs> yeah. Gigglewick. I majored in juggling at Gigglewick. Yeah, for real. <laughs> I come from a long line of guys who stand on top of a ball. I studied at Gigglewick. That's where I met Duckworth at Gigglewick. I minored in, in the juggling. Teletubby <laughs> studies at Gigglewick. Gigglewick University. This is crazy. Professor Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> <laughs> Keith was always hands on and taught himself how to build model airplanes and even made a radio control uh, that could work up to two miles away, which I guess he um, used to pilot planes. That's kind of cool. Uh, Keith used his inherent knowledge to question his teachers, which often got him in trouble. Quote, It was the first time that I actually went on my own analysis of a situation and came to my own conclusions. <laughs> two plus two is five. Uh, <laughs> he, he said this of his healthy skepticism. I can spot the bullshit factor from a hundred yard range. If anyone <laughs> makes a statement about a physical or mechanical phenomenon, I have a little automatic mechanism which says, hey on, is that right? <laughs> and then it starts another mechanism to work out what is right. I love that. <laughs> this attitude would land him in even more oh, trouble. So if I take this vaccine... <laughs> <laughs> this attitude would land him in even more trouble when he joined the Royal Air Force. Duckworth's stint at the RAF was short-lived. He was initially denied entry to the pilot program, but eventually regraded into it. He flew a, a de Havilland Tiger Moth biplane and was Tiger inching closer Moth. to becoming an RAF pilot when he was suddenly thrown out for risky behavior. Quote, I was then flung out for dangerous and incompetent night flying. I actually went to sleep in the circuit. So he's falling asleep in his plane. Yeah. Yeah. After the Royal Air Force, Keith worked towards an engineering degree from the Imperial College of London. Oh, Joe just brought out a book. I read this book in preparation for this. I didn't write this script, but... uh, Sixth edition. He was like, find his radio controlled things in a field, and he twisted his ankle. Uh Uh-huh. Then someone put some, like, sticky bandage on his... Uh, ankle, okay. but he was allergic to the glue in it, and so he got like super sick and couldn't sleep, and then like, but needed to get his hours in the yeah, plane. plane, and so like he kind of got screwed out because he only had like a couple hours left to get his mm. certification or whatever. Well, he should have been practicing the real flying instead of playing with his little airplanes. I know, yeah, it's kind of dumb. How do you twist your ankle flying in an airplane? Yeah, you're standing there. Uh, look, there's the mirrors on the golf. Or oh, on the race whoa. Car. That's wow. sick. Are they from a race car? No, I'm sure they just copied them. Oh. So, yeah, after he got kicked out for flying his little airplane, uh, Keith worked towards an engineering degree from the Imperial College of London, where he found a hobby in motorsport. He raced an Austin 7 at courses like Goodwood and Brands Hatch and eventually upgraded to a Lotus 6. Having learned from his mistakes with the Austin and never ready to settle for mediocrity, Keith decided that the Lotus had to be built with the best components. Duckworth went straight to the source, the Lotus headquarters. He ordered the Coventry Climax engine (laughs) (laughs) and an MG gearbox, which is the most expensive upgrades you could order at the time. They were 250 pounds. Oh, what a world. Yeah. Uh, During one of his many trips to Lotus is when Keith met Mike Coston. But it would still be a few more years before the two worked alongside each other at the Lotus factory. Nice. Duckworth graduated in 57 and started looking for mechanical work out in the field, but not the same field that he broke his ankle in. No, <laughs> no that's a bad field. <laughs> he interviewed at luxury automotive companies that also had aeronautic divisions like Napier and Rolls-Royce before the opportunity of a lifetime fell upon him. Graham Hill we now know as the two-time Formula One champion and all-around Riz King, no. was working as... No. <laughs> I just read what's on the page. I know you do. Yeah. Whoever put this in is 
dead. <laughs> I did. Whoever <laughs> put this in is dead. Uh, <laughs> Graham Hill is working as the lead gearbox engineer at Lotus and was eyeing his departure from the company to focus on racing full time. Quote, Graham Hill was about to leave Lotus. I went along to Lotus to see Colin Chapman, and he offered me a job straight out of college as a gearbox development engineer. Keith accepted Chapman's offer of 600 pounds a year. Little did he know, this would be one of the most challenging assignments he would ever face. Just not in a mechanical sense. We should do a subscription box yeah. for car people called Gearbox. And we just yeah. send you bullshit. That we buy wherever. <laughs> like laser cut wood models of the Nürburgring. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. a good one. <laughs> that's like one that you're like, oh. God, cool. What am I supposed to do? Yeah. yeah, it's only this big. I can't display it. But we yeah. like skimp on packaging, so it's broken <laughs> it by breaks. the time. It, yeah, it's yeah. always broken. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we take. Here's what we do. Yeah, we take all the free swag. Yeah, that the companies send us. Oh, yes. Yeah, and then we just send it out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a tiny bucket hat that doesn't fit my enormous head. Wow, well, I got a ah. Toyo lanyard <laughs> and Hankook socks. Whoa, distressed Alpine Stars jeans? <laughs> well, well, do we have this? <laughs> <those? laughs> I was like, I'll take those. I'll take some new jeans. <laughs> All my jeans eventually just get so greasy and oily yeah. and disgusting. You, you should have my jeans here. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we're in a rare category of media personalities who have like work clothes and home clothes. It sucks. But my home clothes are my nice clothes. My they eventually clothes just mix together and all yeah. all get ruined. Yeah. And then it's like I have to buy more shirts. You know, like I have pairs of shoes that I haven't worn just because I like buy them and then forget. Like, oh yeah, I can't wear them to work. Yeah. yeah. And you're at work all the time. I'm so. at work all the time. Clocking. I'm clocking, at work clocking, all the time. Clocking. Work all the time. For a living. <laughs> <laughs> work Sorry. all the that's a shirt. I'm at work yeah. all the time. I'm a <laughs> for a living. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pretty woman. If there's one thing that you should know about Colin Chapman, it's that he was all about saving weight and money. If the, this is a man whose famous quotes include simplify, then add lightness, and the ominous, any car which holds together for a whole race is too heavy. Hmm. <laughs> this commitment to shaving pounds often backfired during the early days of Lotus. Um, the queer box was the perfect example of this. Okay. That's a quote. Okay. I know I've said some stuff in my career that you guys like to point out, but I didn't write any of it. It was all given to me by other people. <laughs> Chapman wanted it to be the smallest and lightest five-speed transmission possible. He gave it an especially low drive shaft line to accommodate a lower driving position, which dropped both the center of mass and overall air resistance of the race car. The problem was... The gearbox would fail before the end of almost every race. Uh, yeah, I'd say that's a problem. I mean, <laughs> let's put it to a vote, fellas. Do you think that's a problem? Show of hands. Three for three, unanimous. It's a problem. Initially, the job of fixing it fell on Graham Hill, who found that the crown wheel pinion of the final drive would fail after only 50 miles, mm. while the rest of the gearbox would wear down to the point of being unable to select gears, leaving drivers with the infamous box full of neutrals. With Duckworth on the job, finding and fixing the issues of the queer box was no issue. The two main problems with the box, Keith said, were that the gears had very short internal splines to locate the selected linkage and that the crown wheel and pinion were not getting enough lubrication. Mm. I made up some shields and then some jets, convinced myself that oil would now get up to the gears and that if we assembled it properly, that there was a fair chance it would work. <laughs> Everyone is Jeremy Clarkson. <laughs> <laughs> the first test they did with the new setup worked flawlessly. Keith had fixed the gearbox without breaking a sweat. 
Not a single one. <laughs> but paying for these upgrades, that was the real challenge. Mm. Chapman was unwilling to pay for the changes Duckworth felt were necessary to fix the transmission. And the conflict eventually led to tension between the engineers and Chapman. Maybe he just didn't have enough money and he's embarrassed to tell them. <laughs> Despite Keith's failure to make headway at Lotus, the time he spent there was not in vain. He had found something utterly invaluable while working at the factory. A friendship with Mike Costin, who had risen to the position of technical director at Lotus and Colin Chapman's right-hand man. There is a fundamental thing about Mike and me. We are understanders. We think out how things actually work. What is quite remarkable about Mike is that he really understands what I'm about and what everything is about. And I am part of everything. When Duckworth made the decision to leave Lotus, he spent two and a half hours systematically critiquing Chapman's business management style, his unwillingness to listen to reason and logic, his resistance to change, the lie, the manipulation. At the end of the meeting, Keith dropped the bomb that he and Mike Costin were starting a new company, but it turns out that Colin Chapman had one more manipulation up his sleeve. Chapman had heard rumblings of a new breakoff company started, and to get ahead of it, he made Mike Costin sign a three-year non-compete work mm. contract with Lotus, meaning that Costin couldn't leave. And if he did, then he couldn't compete. And any side work was forbidden. Forbidden. You're forbidden. You're forbidden. You're quite forbidden, mate. So the two ventured out on their own and founded Cosworth. Oh, it's the combination of their names, mm -hmm. which is a portmanteau, a portmanteau of Costin <laughs> and Duckworth. Cosworth. Huh. And Costin continued to work as a key Lotus engineer through 1962. It just sounds like a word that should exist. Yeah, it? Cosworth, Cosworth is a yeah. sick It's really name. good. Duckworth? Better than Duxton. Yeah. Duxton. Me Duxton's kind of sick, though. Duxton, Duxton sounds Duxton like a... Really Duxton sick. sounds... Uh, like an uh, like outerwear company. Or like a kid that moves to your sixth grade class. Duxton. Hey, Duxton. Or this like, is Duxton. Yeah, like a, a monkey. <laughs> yeah. A monkey that checks into a hotel. Duxton. Duxton checks in. <laughs> this is Duxton. Duxton. And then Duxton moves. Yeah, Duxton moves away after two years. Yeah, you're like his dad's yeah, in the army, yeah. so they're always oh, yeah. moving and then, around. Yeah. And then like thirty years later, you're like, I wonder what happened to Duxton. I think about that all the time yeah. with like kids that I grew up with. Yeah. 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 Like, Facebook. Kinda, some people are not on Facebook. Yeah. My, the one that I always think of, if you're out there, Derek, 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 we're hit calling me up, you dude. out, dude. We used to hang out. We used to talk about Darkwing Duck all the time. All the time. His mom, Deirdre, would drive us around and point out that if you connected all my freckles, you could find Darkwing Duck. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what, dude? <laughs> What man? Did she connect all your freckles? <laughs> Did she ever connect your freckles? <laughs> no, but she said he could if you drew a little line. If you let me. Yeah. If you let me. <laughs> Deirdre, what the hell? What the hell, Deirdre? <laughs> Deirdre, what? <laughs> what, Deirdre? So anyway, Derek. This up, Dear, man. Yeah. This up and tell us what the f the mom is. Yeah, what are you doing, man? Deirdre? <laughs> you guys must have talked about Darkwing Duck so, so much. Well, they they if you hadn't noticed, they love alliterations with D's. Yeah. So like every Deer, oh. Derek, Deirdre, Darkwing, Deirdre, okay. Darkwing Duck. Yeah. I am the terror that flies in the night. <laughs> <laughs> Big thank you to Subaru for sponsoring this episode. For anyone who believes that life is about the journey, not the destination, discover the 2024 Subaru Crosstrek Wilderness. Adventure is a big part of an active lifestyle, but sometimes you gotta push it to the edge. The Subaru Crosstrek has always appealed to the adventure seekers with its legendary standard symmetrical all-wheel drive. But now, the Subaru Crosstrek Wilderness goes even further. An enhanced dual-function X-Mode combined with 9.3 inches of ground clearance gives increased capability. Tough new off-road wheels with all-terrain tires designed 
designed for even more daunting trails. This trusty Subaru is built to take you to the limit, and yet its retuned standard EyeSight driver assist technology is there to watch over you. Bold accent colors and new rugged exterior houses its equally durable water repellent StarTech seats in a surprisingly spacious cabin. When I saw Subaru first introduce their wilderness line, I was like, when are they gonna do the cross track? And now since it's been revealed, dude, this thing looks dope. Give it a look. This thing is super versatile and capable. It's at home on the road or out in the bush helping you with your camping trip. The wilderness is the top of the cross track range. You're not gonna be able to buy a more capable cross track from the dealer. You gotta go with the wilderness. Discover the Subaru cross track wilderness, the newest member of Subaru's wilderness family. Adventure on the edge. Learn more at Subaru.com. EyeSight is a driver assist system that may not operate optimally under all driving conditions. The driver is responsible for safe and attentive driving. System effectiveness depends on many factors. See your owner's manual. Big thanks to Electric E-Bikes for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. No matter how you're approaching 2024, Electric E-Bikes can help you go the distance. From commutes to adventures, riders of all abilities can explore this new year with Electric E-Bikes. Go to electricebikes.com to learn more about their wide selection of e-bikes that start at just $7.99 with the XP Lite. That's L-E-C-T-R-I-C-E bikes.com. These look sick. They look really easy to use. They look comfortable. They ship free. They come fully assembled and foldable for easy travel and storage. That's huge. Honestly, if you commute, but you have to drive a little bit to your commute and then you have to commute the rest of the way on the bike, you can just fold it up, put it in the back of your car. So explore 2024 with electric bikes, the most accessible and adventurous e-bikes ever. Visit electricebikes.com to learn more. And be sure to mention that Pass Gas by Donut Media sent you in the post checkout service. Survey. That's L E C T R I C E bikes.com. Now, because of Colin Chapman's last minute slight, the two were forced to produce parts exclusively for Lotus until Costin's contract expired. During that time, Costin played a part in the development of everything from the Lotus 15 through the Lotus 26, a list that includes <laughs> the Lotus 18, because mm. that's how numbers work. <laughs> <laughs> The company's first mid-engine single-seater. Oh. Also included the Lotus 25, the company's first F1 world champion, and the Lotus Elan, a.k.a. the car that inspired the Miata. Nice. One of them. One of them. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, yeah, it's the Lotus Elan and Bigfoot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The monster truck? Mm hmm. Oh. I love the monster More truck. More from like a Bigfoot. spiritual place? Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I just typed in Bigfoot monster. It's a monster truck. It's like, yeah, it's like, it'll be small like the Lotus Alon. It's like, yeah, but it's got to have the heart of Bigfoot. <laughs> Look, yeah, Chris. Yeah, man. Okay, it will. Yeah. It will have the heart of Bigfoot. Yeah. I like the blue on the <laughs> Bigfoot. Yeah. Can we make a blue Miata? <laughs> okay, Chris. Yeah. Oh, Ugh. man. At the same time, Costin was moonlighting at Cosworth with Duckworth, already <laughs> laying the groundwork for the revolution <laughs> to come. Initially, their work was done exclusively on Ford Kent engines for Lotus, a sub two liter inline four, largely modifying the cylinder heads with improved camshafts. This led to success in Formula Junior, but also provided power to an early version of the Lotus 7. However, it was the work they do leading up to 1965 on the MAE, the Modified Anglia Engine, that would mm. really start the Cosworth story in earnest. Goes to camp. <laughs> <laughs> Here, they replace the side draft intake ports of the head with downdraft carbs brazed onto the cast iron head, allowing Whoa. gravity to help in the process of delivering wow. the air fuel mixture into the combustion chamber. What does braised mean? Uh, so like it's like, like welding, beef. but not. It doesn't use like an electric arc. It's oh, it's like just straight up heat. Heat, yeah. Okay, heat like braised rib, braised short ribs. I yeah. used to work at the Dairy Queen brazer. Did you? Yeah. Oh my god. I'd make I'd f with my friends. They'd come in for uh, you know, Blizzard. Yeah. I'd put chili in it. Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> That's sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's chilly in here. <laughs> what the hell, Joe? <laughs> God, dude. 
<laughs> I said, I gotcha. I'll make you a new one. <laughs> the company's like, why are we spending so much money at the Brazer location on chili and ice cream? <laughs> All right, all this brazing of the cylinder heads uh, allowed the 105E engine, which delivered only 39 hersperrs upon its debut, to punch out over 100 hersperrs per liter reliably. Per liter. Per liter. Whoa. That's an improvement of over 250%. The MAE dominated Formula Junior and Formula 3 until new regulations prevented its use in 1968. Ah, oh, man, that's how it always happens, right? I know. You make it so good, and then they're like... They're like, not allowed. No. Nope. Not allowed. Sorry, baby. Yeah. Mm. Finally, the two had a bit of freedom to implement their own designs and innovations to make better, faster, stronger, higher revving engines that were more reliable. Without limitations, the pair's true genius shined, as well as their admiration for each other. I like how much... They talk about how mm-hmm. they liked each other in this. That's this whole book is it's them just like, like buds. Mike Corson was so bloody smart. That's so <laughs> cool. I feel like that's not a thing that we do these days. Nobody gives each other props. No. Yeah. Everyone's like, yeah, he's pretty good, but like I did it too. I was there too. It's because we're all getting screwed all the time. You feel like you got to <laughs> speak up for yourself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no one else is going to do it. As Mike recalled, Keith could take anything from start to finish, from concept to layout, to the design details, to making prototype bits, to assembling it himself, to showing how it would work and understanding the principles involved. He was totally sold. He was the brightest I had ever come across. Colin couldn't stand this bloke was so bright. And similarly, Keith said of Mike, I thought Mike was supremely capable. We actually are a brilliant pair. He is still a racing mechanic by nature, whereas I tend to think too long. You need that yin yang. You You need that Mm. yin yang. You do need that yin yang. Yeah. Where do you see (laughs) Monday? Until now, Cosworth was operating as a subsidiary of Lotus, but they were ready for the next step in their evolution. Independence. This is before America. Yeah. This is 1968. This predates is, America by quite a long time. This is eight years before America. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do for the 50th anniversary of America? I don't know, man. 1976, baby. <laughs> In the 1960s, Ford was serious about racing. This is the era that brought us Shelby, the Cobra, the Cobra Daytona, and the GT40. But that was all on this side of the pond. Over in England, Ford of Europe was working just as hard to establish a new performance era. And Walter Hayes, the head of public affairs at Ford of England and the man responsible for the GT40, was looking to make a big old splash. A big old splash splash in the pond. I think it's so cheeky when they call it a pond because it's really an ocean. It's It's a lot bigger than a pond. Yeah, Yeah. that's what I was going to say. Oh, you, you yeah. too? Downplay much? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, Lotus had lost its contract with uh, Coventry Climax, who had previously provided the engines for Lotus race cars. In 1965, the FIA decided that after 1966, the maximum engine capacity for Formula One would increase from 1.5 to 3 liters. That's and- double. And Coventry wasn't interested in producing the larger engines, so Chapman turned to his old friends over at Cosworth. Lotus knew that in order to win in F1, they need a big old V8. But engine development was and is anything but cheap. Toyota famously spent uh, over a billion dollars developing the Lexus LS430. We should figure out another I know. engine I know. that costs a lot of money. Yeah. Because this is the only one we ever use. I know. Well, because it costs $400 million. Yeah, that was a lot. Yeah. That is a lot of money. It is. When Chapman first approached Duckworth about building him a revolutionary new V8 made from scratch, Duckworth knew he could make it happen. He just needed the money. But it was money that Lotus didn't have. Oh, God. That's I need all money, but needed. that's all I don't have. Yeah. <laughs> well, he just needed the money. Yeah. But that's the one thing they didn't have? That's it. Oh, 
They're gonna what have to are find, they going to do? They're gonna have to Wait, a solution. But, but all they need is money. Then. Yeah. 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 Don't they have money? No. Oh, oh that's oh, the one thing man. they don't that's have. They don't what? have. Oh, we what went are they over this. Do? Well, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. That's a huge that's problem. What we're saying, <laughs> yeah, it's a big problem. I'd say <laughs> if the one thing that they need is the money, that's all they need. Thing they don't. But <laughs> well, they're good then, right? No. 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 Listen. Listen. It's what? the one thing that they don't have. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude. They're screwed. Isn't this crazy? Yeah. God. Pack it up. Oh. Pack it up. I'm sure the next paragraph is going to be so they gave up. <laughs> they went home. Actually, ordered a pizza. No, check this out. What? Chapman contacted Ford. At huh? Dearborn, Dearborn, Michigan, as well as Aston Martin, uh. to try to secure funding, oh, money. Yeah, so they're good. Money? Then. That's another word for money: is yeah. funding. They're good. Okay, then, so right? they're trying. Well, neither of the companies oh, are interested. Oh, come on! <laughs> That's what they needed. That's all they needed. Yeah, I know. The one thing they didn't have. <laughs> they couldn't get it. From Ford? From Ford. Did they ask him? They did. <laughs> Aston Martin? Did they ask Aston them? Aston Martin too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the second one I was going to ask. Chapman's old friend, though, Walter Hayes, was intrigued. Oh. oh. <laughs> Just a few years earlier, they'd collaborated on the Lotus Cortina, a car that was a huge success both on the track and in the showroom. I love it. It's a little square car. Yeah. And together, along with Harley Coop, the British-based American engineer who masterminds Ford's explosion into NASCAR in the 50s, this team came up with a strategy to conquer Formula One together. Harley Coop is a cool name. Harley Coop. You're not going to believe this, guys, but suddenly Cosworth was flush with cash. What? Oh! But money wasn't the only benefit this partnership would afford. Previously, demand That's for That's the one thing they needed. Yeah, now they got it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Previously, demand for Cosworth's engines was so high that they were having trouble keeping up. And as a result... The majority of MAE engines were sold as kits where the customer did the assembly. But with Ford now in the mix, remember, uh, Walter Hayes was the PR guy for Ford of Europe. Yeah. Uh, Cosworth was responsible for the development <clears throat> of the engines, and Ford would take care of the manufacturing. So Ford would build them, Cosworth designed them. That's great for That's Cosworth. Good. Yeah. Uh, now, Cosworth could concentrate solely on their strongest asset design and the plan was put in place in fact as far as cosworth was concerned it had already begun it had already begun so they're already doing better than lotus basically i guess back in 1964 cosworth had developed the sca which was a one liter two valve single overhead cam four cylinder engine based on the cortina's 116e block and it was intended for Formula 2. It featured the first 100% Cosworth design head. It had a forged crankshaft. It had steel main bearing caps and pistons. Steel pistons, wow. Uh, and a head gasket with all metal O-rings so it could run at a higher compression. Additionally, the intake ports and oil pickup in the dry sump were both canted over 25 degrees because Lotus wanted to mount the engine at a 25 degree angle for a lower center of gravity. That's pretty sick. That is sick. I love well, that. Yeah. With the engine at an angle, the intake ports and oil pickup were now faced straight up and down. That's but, cool. Yeah. It is cool. Yeah. But there was a problem. What? what? <laughs> Another one? <clears throat> yeah. The SCA featured a reverse flow design in the head, meaning the intake and exhaust ports were on the same side of the engine. That means the air has to go in, and then when it, it's making a U-turn so to get out. And you need to put a oh. bunch of crap on each of those. It's just, it, it, it's not problem. efficient. It doesn't to put, flow very well. You need to put throttle body, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, intake stuff, like throttle body yeah. or carbs. <laughs> if and, your grandpa has like an old uh, Slant 6, like Mopar engine, or mm -hmm. I, th I think the Ford Slant 6 is also this way, you'll see where the, like the carb, the intake manifold goes on and then you have to like snake the exhaust in between the oh. openings. That's probably not great for temperature. I know. Your That's intake, right. It heats up your intake air as well. Hot air Very intake, hot. more like. That's and true. And hot air isn't as dense as cold air. That's which true. Which means less power, baby. Yes, sir. This engine sucks. This led to several <laughs> limitations, mostly in spacing. With two Weber downdraft sand cast carburetors. Hey. Dude, you never want to stand downdraft from Weber. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Him and Pumbaa. I had Vindaloo for lunch. <laughs> 
The SCA was able to put out Snake Vindaloo. (laughs) (laughs) The SCA was able to put out only 115 horsepower from a 997 uh, cubic centimeters. That's good. That's decent. one liter. Yeah. That's pretty decent. Uh, that thing is pretty high. I mean, though. this is the 60s. Yeah. yeah early 60s. That's, that's not great. That thing it's not was bad. a screamer, though. Yeah. But uh, it could uh, be better. That's not like a Honda Civic four cylinder. It could no. be better, though. Yeah. With the addition of Lucas fuel injection in 1966. But now number, we got a throttle body. It was bumped up to 140 horsepower. But Ooh. to push that number any higher would require some serious modifications. And in the 60s, Taking your ideas from theory to reality meant you had to actually build it yourself. That's Think what about. it means now, too. <laughs> <laughs> One liter making 140 horsepower is really good. Yeah. Pretty good, yeah. I bet that thing was like, ah! Yeah. ah! Definitely, but it's going to get even louder. Uh, I bet that th- thing screamed like a stuck snake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stuck! <laughs> Cosworth would land on one of their more... Wait, did you just... <laughs> Snakes don't make noise, and they also don't get stuck. That would cause one to scream. Yeah, yeah that's you. true. Yeah. That's the... That's probably why I never that's heard That's why it. it's an old-timey saying. Is it, really? Snakes don't get stuck, and they don't scream. Can you imagine if they did? <laughs> it must be a pretty scary situation. Yeah, be like, I'm really stuck! Yeah. Ah! <laughs> Yeah, that thing <laughs> scream. That engine screams like a stuck snake. <laughs> <laughs> this is where Cosworth would land on one of their more truly unique innovations, something they continue to do to this very day, proving an engine design works by building only half of it at a time. What? They realized that the concepts that would make a hypothetical V8 successful oh, yeah. could be proven by building a fantastic inline four engine and then. Dublin it. That's sick. That's what they do that a lot now. Yeah. The first stage of this two pronged attack, a temporal pincer, if you will, if you're if you're a tenant fan, Christopher Nolan, uh wow. resulted That's in the FVA the four valve type A engine. It utilized the cross flow head designed for the Cortina and modified it for use in Formula Two. So now they actually instead of the air have the air fuel mixture having to do that U turn in and out of the motor. Mm-hmm. Now it's right across. Much the head. better. Much yeah. more efficient. It uh, we already said that at 1.6 liters, it had 16 valves, so it's moving a lot of air. Dual overhead cams and delivered an astonishing 220 horsepower at 9,000 RPM. The same now space. we're talking, dude. It's like a freaking K24. Right? Yeah, dude. This is Except when it's we smaller. Start- it's even smaller. Yeah, dude. 1.6 liter, 16 valve, four cylinder, dual overhead cam. I'm starting to recognize this mm-hmm. Cosworth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is the Cosworth I see on mm-hmm. Facebook Marketplace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that power figure was pretty amazing for the time. 9,000 RPM. Yeah, dude. dude. For reference, one of the most popular British sports cars of the era, the MGB, was delivering short of 100 horsepower from a larger <laughs> 1.8 liter engine oh with a red God. line of just 6,000 RPM. Oh, snooze this is 9, fast. Dude, this I is bet 9, this Cosworth. I bet this four valve type A engine screams like a stuck snake. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what allows it to rev that high? Is it just like stronger internals? I would imagine so. And I mean, and now it's pumping more air too. So like it's pumping more air. Yeah. It's got healthier yeah. spinny bits. I mean, it's really top to tails. With with the FVA, the concept <laughs> had been tongue proven. to tail. You tongue still doing tail. snake <laughs> euphemisms? <laughs> yeah. With the FVA, the concept had been proven. It was time for Cosworth to change the game once more. Would you cons- would you say that a snake has a tail? A snake is a tail. <laughs> the whole body is a tail? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. This is the kind of philosophical inquiry you can only find on past gas. A snake, a snake is a human tail. A snake is a, <laughs> a, snake is a human tail? Yeah. What is a human tail? A snake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so they come from humans. They just fall off and then they start being their own animal. I think that's what the Bible said. Probably. <laughs> this is what an FBA sounds like. Dang. That's a four cylinder. That's a lot of mechanical chatter. Yeah. Let's get up to 9K. What's that, 4,500? I don't know. That's the clip. That's not 9K. That was from 12 years ago. Damn. 
Sounds like shit. <laughs> Top comment. That didn't go too well then. No. <laughs> like? That thing <laughs> as donut? No kidding. Oh, maybe. I should. Yeah, comment okay. as donut. <laughs> I'm doing it. Big thanks to Shopify for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Selling a little... Or a lot. Shopify helps you do your thing, however you're cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your little online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way up to, did we just hit half a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. What I love about Shopify is that it gives you control over how you grow your business. This is the kind of tool that I'm looking for if I'm going to start a business. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash gas, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash gas now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash gas. Thanks, Shopify. Big thanks to Indeed for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. We are driven by a search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search. Match. With Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. I've done hiring in the past for Donut, and it is a pain in the butt. But if I had a tool like Indeed when I was doing hiring, it would have made things so much easier. Just their matching function is super robust. So join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash PassGas. Just go to Indeed.com slash PassGas right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash PassGas. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. What they came up with was eventually nicknamed the Messiah Engine. And the nickname made sense. <laughs> <laughs> the car it debuted in, the Lotus 49, would go on to change Formula One forever. The engine itself would dominate the sport for the next 17 years, winning at its very first outing in 1967 and remaining a commanding force until the turbo era hit its stride in 1983, prompting a frustrated Duckworth to comment, Teba charges are for people who can't build engines. Wow. Nice, dude. Sounds like he can't build his engine. Oh, damn, Nolan. If he's getting beaten. Dude, he throwed some shade and you were like, like, you throw shade? Well, call me Mr. Umbrella. I just say, I mean, this is pretty (laughs) typical. Uh... (laughs) <laughs> Didn't Ferrari say that aerodynamics are also for people yeah. who can't build engines? <laughs> That's yeah. always someone who's like, damn it. Damn, I got beat. That's because yeah, yeah. they can't build a thing that powers the thing that beat me. No, but the thing that I was doing before was good for me. Yeah, there's there's no ah. replacement for displacement. That's Why'd right. you have to think of a new thing that I'm not the best at? <laughs> Unfair. Let's Unfair. ban that. Unfair and also... Lame? (laughs) (laughs) The Lotus 49's dominance was largely due to something Colin Chapman held very close to his heart. Its lightness and rigidity. Hmm. While teams like Ferrari and BRM were sticking with V12 and H16 engines, respectively, H16, a flat 16 boy... Justin would nut. <laughs> Can you imagine wow. how hard Justin would nut if we showed him a H16, a big old flat engine with Dang. eight cylinders coming straight out of each side? Yeah. Justin Whoa. would nut. <laughs> Dude, how hard would Justin nut? I don't even want to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> this thing is crazy. It's huge, though. Oh my God! Don't show that picture to Justin. He nut. I'm gonna need to wipe my screen off after I show it to Justin. Yeah, because he's gonna nut. How wide is that thing? That thing's sick. 
Dude, Only you gotta, inches wide. You gotta put that in Justin Subaru. He's not. <laughs> <laughs> Chapman's design for the Lotus 49, which was developed for and in conjunction with this new engine, called for a small V8 to keep things as light as possible. More importantly, the entire design centered around using the engine itself as a structural member of the car. Hell yeah, dude. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hell yeah? Hell yeah. That's pretty tight. That's, TVH? <laughs> that's TAH. That's super ahead of the time. That hell. Yeah. That's sick. Dude. I love that. Yeah. Eliminating the need for a rear... You know what that does? It eliminates the need for a rear subframe. Oh, oh dude. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, now that you say that. Yeah, I colloquialized oh. it. <laughs> This meant that while the larger engines could theoretically deliver more power, they'd also be heavier and less structurally sound. Mm. Chapman knew this to be true because he was losing the 1966 season while using a BRM H16. Oh, you Mm. idiot. (laughs) To him, this just proved the idea that adding power makes you faster on the straights. Subtracting weight makes you faster. Everywhere. Ooh. That's his quote. I love that. Yeah, this dude's full of quotes. He's. Uh, I've heard that quote. He's a slick talker. I've heard but that quote. He, uh, reading this book made me really not like him. Yeah, he's mm. super manipulative. He lied to everyone. Really, he seems kind of reddity. <laughs> <laughs> he talks like a redditor. <laughs> now he's. I think power. I think power makes you faster all the straights. Subtracted weight makes you faster <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> He would have uh, loved R slash cars for sure. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, actually, adding power makes you faster in the streets. So, tracting power makes you faster everywhere. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking about getting my first car. Should I get a BRM H16? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Too big. I uh, used uh, my. Not enough power. No, no. Too much. Too much power because adding power you do. Pass all the straights. So titanium power makes it pass all everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> On top of that, because the engine wouldn't be covered up by the tubes of the frame, it would be easier to work on before and especially during the race. While the Lotus 49 is often cited as the first car to utilize the engine as a stressed member of the car, this actually, uh, this actually isn't true. <laughs> <laughs> Cars like the Lancia D50 played with this concept to a degree back in 1954, and Ferrari used it wholly with the 158 mm. in 1964 before abandoning it in 1966. Take that to your trivia night. Yeah, take yeah. that to some very specific bar trivia. <laughs> but the difference between those cars and the Lotus, Lotus got it right. <laughs> As Duckworth was famous for saying, in engineering, there is an answer to everything. It's just what we're usually too ignorant or too dim to see. After the explosive debut of the Lotus 49, the quote, engine as a stress member of the car design would become the configuration for Formula Un, something that continues to this very day. Dude, dim is a very underused What are you, dim? Insult. Yeah. Oh, it's so, it's that hurts. Yeah. It yeah. <laughs> hurts your feelings, you know? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Some of the, your feelings may never heal after hearing something like that. Dude, being called dim, what are you, dim? No. Yeah. It, because it, it kind of feels like What does like that mean? And then it takes you a second to like catch not up right. to oh, my, yeah. The light in my head's not very yeah. bright. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're like, you're already behind, mm-hmm. you know, like. It's like more polite than calling someone stupid. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that they think you're so stupid that they're being nice to you. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah. yeah. But it wasn't just the layout that was responsible for the dominance of the Lotus 49. It was the engine itself labeled the dfv for double four valve okay that's exactly what it was two fva engines connected by a common crankshaft the first of the fvas hit the dyno in february of 1966 and by august of the same year development was complete allowing duckworth to, to dive headfirst into his money bin 
As a duck does. Allowing Duckworth to dive headfirst into his V8 project. A short seven months later, the DFVs were ready for testing. Cool. At the time, the DFV was legendary. Dual overhead cams. 32 valves. Over square design. Oh, so the... Huge. That's why I can rev really high. Yeah. So that means the... It, the width of the piston is longer than the. It's a chode. Yeah, it's longer than the. So the, it's the fatter the than connecting Paul? rod. Yeah. yeah. Hamburger. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. SR20s yeah. are have a square, display, like piston. Perfect square. It, yeah, they're like equal. Yeah. Uh, and that is like one of the reasons people like that engine so much is because the torque and the horsepower okay. oh. are very close to each other. So does. Over square mean that there's like, is that? So this is from vikingbags.com. Oh, uh, nice. Uh, nice. I go there all the time. Viking bags. <laughs> Over square engines have a wider cylinder and produce high RPM and yeah. power output. Under Chode. square engines. So higher output, less torque. Yeah. Under, Under square, square engines have longer torque. cylinders and produce low RPM and more torque. That's yeah. why uh, like diesel engines have long <laughs> cylinders. Yeah. They mm. may, they're very torquey. Yeah, because yeah, they like this. Boys. Yeah. 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 And then uh under squares. Yeah. Yeah. Ah! More, more uh leverage on that crankshaft. More leverage on the crankshaft. Just to review, it had dual overhead cams, thirty two valves. That's a lot. Over square design, which means higher RPMs, higher output. Yes, sir. A typical ninety degree V eight, aluminum blocking head. <laughs> Direct injection okay. and uh, Lucas mechanical fuel injection. Nice. So it was just pumping gas right into the pumping cylinder. Pumping and dumping. Pumping and dumping. That's Direct right. injection is pretty cool for that era. Yeah, it yeah. is. Pretty advanced. Has there ever been an engine with more than four valves per cylinder? Yeah, mine. I have five. Five really? valve. Yeah. 20 valve Volkswagen engines. Oh, yeah, because it's a four cylinder. I never thought of that. Yeah, so like a 1.8T is a four-cylinder with five. Yeah. Sorry, it's just a moment of dimness on my part. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's dim? A good, that's a good question. At 400 horsepower, it wasn't the most powerful engine in the field, but it was not dim, light. <laughs> <laughs> the, the engine and the lack of extra structural components to support it meant that the entire car came in very close to Formula Mum's minimum weight restriction. <laughs> Formula Mum. Formula <laughs> Mum. Formula Mum. <laughs> you guys know what I mean. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> Formula Mum. Formula Mum. Wait, the weight restriction was 1,100 pounds? Wow. A 400 horsepower engine <laughs> in an 1,100 pound car. Damn, yeah. that's all an ass, dude. Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, that's kind of the point, gentlemen. I know, but uh, this is like oh, so. Yeah. It's kind of the point, huh? Formula really? Mum, no mental around. <laughs> this gave the Lotus 49 an advantage over other cars, which were two to 300 pounds heavier at the time. It was the ultimate manifestation of the famous Duckworth quote. Working things for yourself from the first principles and providing proper engineering solution never goes out of fashion. That's a famous That's quote. That's that famous quote, dude. <laughs> when I think of Duckworth, I think of that quote. <laughs> Working things for yourself from first principles and providing proper engineering <laughs> solutions never goes out of fashion. Oh, when I no hear that. No fear. <laughs> <laughs> I got that on a shirt. <laughs> but there is one thing standing in its way. It still hadn't been tested. What? <laughs> Wilson! Wilson! <laughs> Get off my plane! <laughs> the spring of 1967 was a wet one. Yeah, it was. Meaning that by the time <laughs> the car... <laughs> <laughs> meaning that by the time the car and engine made their debut at Zanvoort, Sporting Ford proudly on the valve covers, driver Graham Hill had managed only one and a half days of testing. His partner, Jim Clark, fresh from Indianapolis, and just two years after winning the 500 in the first rear engine car in history, the Lotus 38, sat in the car for the very first time on June 1st. Over the next few days, the team ironed out 
the many changes and the fixes the car needed. But the engine ran better than expected. And with 400 horsepower, it was producing more power than the Ferrari V12 at the time with four fewer cylinders. Wow. Even with many details left to iron out, what if Ferrari was like, V8s are for people who can't build engines. V8s are for people who can't build engines. (laughs) Hill managed to set a lap record in qualifying, finishing six seconds faster than the previous record and snagging pole position. Good Uh, I think that's a pretty good test. Yeah. Come race day, Graham jumped out in the lead and stayed there for the next 10 laps before a broken camshaft took him out of the race. That's a bummer. Clark, on the other hand, still getting used to the new car he'd only met three days before, took another five laps to get acquainted with the little Lotus before snatching the, the lead and holding on to it for the final 74 laps of the race, finishing an incredible 27 seconds ahead of the rest Damn. of the field. He's a regular Max Verstappen out At there. At Zanvor? Regular At Max Verstappen. And while reliability problems would mean that Clark would only be able to secure three more wins for the rest of the season, leaving him 10 points behind Denny Hume in the Drivers' Championship, the writing was on the wall. The engine as a stressed member configuration would soon be the standard in Formula One rather than the outlier. That'd be really disheartening to be at the first race Mm -hmm. of the season and see someone win by 27 seconds. Yeah. I wonder what that's like. Yeah. It's so (laughs) crazy that that ever (laughs) happened in Formula One. Hope it doesn't Doesn't happen happen again. again. That would suck. (laughs) That would make it not fun to watch anymore. (laughs) Up to this point, Ford, Lotus, and Cosworth had an exclusive relationship. They were exclusive. Nice. Finally. I did I didn't think they wanted to put labels on it, but I guess. <laughs> but after witnessing the performance of the DFV in 67, Ford decided that for 68, it would offer the engine for sale to the rest of the field for 7,500 pounds, the equivalent of $220,000 today. Anyone could walk away with a giant killer. Is that really the exchange rate? That's crazy. That's a lot. <laughs> Maybe 75,000 pounds. I don't know. That's a that's a lot. If you wanted to buy an F1 engine today, the sticker would be closer to $10 million for comparison. So unsurprisingly, many people opted in. At times, the entire field was powered by DFVs, with the exception of stubborn old of Ferrari. Course. Yep. And over the course of the next 262 starts, a DFV-powered car would take the win 155 times. Wow. Over this period... Cosworth continued to upgrade the DFV, including adding a turbo in 1975 to create the DFX. Yes. Doubling the horsepower of the stock DFV and becoming the dominant engine. You like your Cosworth V8s, don't you, Joe? This DFX is like one of my favorite engines. You talk about it all. You actually bring it up quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So it doubled the horsepower, doubled the horsepower of the stock DFV, becoming the dominant engine in IndyCar until the 80s. Its longevity was partially because it was very well designed. Partially because it was affordable, and partially because of a bit of luck. Because as F1 entered the ground effect era, the DFV suddenly found itself with a new advantage. Do you want to know my dream build project sure. car? I'd love to. I get a DFX okay. from the 80s. It's, you know, got 10 miles on it yeah, or something. Yeah. It's still in the crate. Yeah, it's still, <laughs> still in the box, yeah. <laughs> Then I get a Nissan Cube and I put it in the back of it. <laughs> Hell yeah. Make it, dude, make it happen. Yeah. Make it happen. As the late 70s arrived, uh, just when an engine like the DFV would be entering the twilight of its career, Colin Chapman dropped another little trick to inject new life into the Messiah engine ground effects, uh, which is when the air underneath the car sucks the car to the ground as opposed to being pushing pushing the car into the ground with wings on top of the car. Yeah. When the DFV debuted, Formula One cars still looked like missiles with wheels. They were gorgeous, but they lacked something crucial, and that was downforce. Chapman began experimenting with uh, developing cars with side skirts to hide Venturi tunnels running along the underside of the car, creating a low-pressure area that would suck the car onto the track. <laughs> and... While the compact V-shaped DFV was perfect for this design, the flat 12s and 16s the competition was using meant there were cylinders where the tunnels needed to be. So once again, Chapman's designs won the day, and the DFV would soldier on to take pole positions in its third and fourth decade. It last scored points in F1 for Terrell in 1990, and even showed up 
in 2013 at the Brazilian Grand Prix. What? what? Didn't in even know what that. car? I have no clue. It also won Le Mans a couple times as well, once for Mirage in 75 and once for Rondo in 1980. Rondo. Rondo. It seemed there was no style of racing that Cosworth couldn't conquer. The company born in 1958 and 10 years later, the DFV had proven they can do more than just modify engines. They could design and dominate, and they were far from done. As Cosworth moved through the next few centuries, they only solidified their legacy in the automotive world, which is something we'll talk about next week in part two, Hell our yeah. conclusion of Cosworth. We'll get to my whale tail, Sierra Cosworth. My whale tail, Sierra Cosworth. That Sierra's got a real whale tail. Okay, so the cars that they ran in 2013 that the DFV was in was in the uh, for Marusha, which was that's a, how you say that Marusha, yeah. And it's Jules Bianchi, rest in peace. Yeah, and Max Chilton, who's still running in, uh, I believe, in IndyCar. Wow, I believe old Max Chilton is still over there. We got some really good listener mail this week uh, from Justin. Oh, dude, if Justin saw that eight sixteen, no. What's up, donation? Okay. <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool. Right. That is cool. Right. For days now, I have been chatting the gases, the food, oils, the blood. I think he meant to say chanting <laughs> from part two of the Mercedes episode. It made me want to make a list of the anatomy of a vehicle. Feel free to change my list or add your input. Truly juiced up to be here. Toot toot, baby toot toot. <laughs> <laughs> and no one, it might have just been Turkey Day, but I hope you gave it the goose. Oh, nice. I sure did. So he says, Justin Felt says, like shit. No, sorry. Gas is the food. Yeah. Gas tank is the tummy. Okay. Yeah. The grill, nose, nostrils, meaning the air take air intake would be the nasal passage. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the okay. bumpers are the knuckles. This is a good uh, one, okay. right? Okay. Uh, it kind of makes sense. Mm? Axles are the legs. Yes. Wheels would be the feet. Tires yeah. would be the shoes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Windshield is the eyes. Yeah, of course. Computer and electronics are the Headlights brain. Headlights aren't the eyes. He's going for like a Pixar Cars kind of methodology, it sounds like, yeah, rather yeah. than like those old Mobile One commercials where the headlights were the eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you see you, you, you see with both. An argument can be made either way. Yeah. Maybe the, the lights are the glasses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, computer and electronics are the brain. The coolant is the sweat keeping the car cool. That's We've all agreed okay, on that. Okay, interesting. Chassis is the spine. Okay. Almost like a turtle. Sure. No, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. And the body is the bones. The body is the bones, the dude. The body is the bones. The motor is the heart. Paint is the skin. <laughs> <laughs> Exhaust system is the lower intestine. Yeah. Exhaust tip is the butthole. Yeah. yeah. Oil is the blood. Oil is the blood. That all checks yes, out, right? I love it. Great job. You know what I thought of yesterday? Oh, okay. You know what the ankle is? What? The CV joint. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? Yep. Yeah. And Max says that the trailing arms are the knees. Sure. Sure. Well, that's been the show. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Join us next week for Cosworth Part 2. Follow James at James Pumphrey. Follow Joe at Joe G. Weber, where you'll find a little picture of a little baby. Yeah. Growing. Up in the, the <laughs> attic. A bun in the oven. Bun in the oven. A Joe's going to be a, a father. I don't think we announced that the last time we no. recorded. No, no, yeah. He told us be off dad. air before we started. Well, we find out things before yeah. you. Yeah. That's cool. Just, just, all just find out it's going to be a little boy. So, what? Yeah. Wow. Uh, I get to teach him car stuff. Yeah, nice. I'm going to make him a massage. And you're, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, the greatest car in the world is the Nissan Cube, yeah. son. And someday, I'm going to buy you one. <laughs> Your your name, that's why your name's Cube, son. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Women are too emotional to be in positions of power. What is this? <laughs> Season six of Survivor, James? All right, that's been the show. Thank you so much. We'll if see you next time. If she gets her period, we'll go to war. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs>